Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to NSE. So happy to see everyone. Um, this is our 638th new social environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Nico Whedon, Ryan Dennis, Ruby Lerner, Mario Gooden, and Thursa nichols Gadith. We're also thrilled to welcome poet Sarah Sophia Yanni here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for the actual necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host, Ryan Dennis is the chief curator and artistic director of the Center for Art and Public Exchange at the Mississippi Museum of Art. Dennis is deeply interested in the intersection of art and social justice while creating equitable opportunities for artists to thrive in their work. Mario Gooden is interim director of the Masters of Architecture program at Columbia, among many other amazing important roles. Gooden is also the director of Mario Gooden Studio, Architecture and Design, a transdisciplinary practice dedicated to the design and exploration of architecture and its relationship to culture and knowledge. Ruby Lerner is the founding executive director of Creative Capital, an innovative arts foundation that adapts venture capital concepts to support individual artists. She sits on the advisory boards of New Inc. and iBeam and is on the board of directors of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. Based in New Haven, Connecticut, Nico Whedon is an independent arts consultant, curator, and educator, and writer. She is also the founder and principal of Building Fund, a visiting critic at the Yale School of Art, and a board member at the National Academy of Design and the Arts Council of Greater New Haven. She is a contributor to the Brooklyn Rail, among other publications. And Thursa Nichols Goodeve writes with rather than on contemporary art and artists. She was senior editor at The Rail from 2017 to 2019 and is currently editor at large. Um, thank you so much for joining our NSC world today, everyone. And I'm so excited to pass it over to you, Thursa. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, welcome everybody. Another wonderful um, moment of the Brooklyn Rail NSC. So today, um, if you would bring up the first slide, we're, we're, the focus of today's discussion is this extraordinary book that Nico Whedon wrote, uh, well, put together. Um, and, we'll, uh, and it's about the museum, and as it, it says, cultivating change through cultural citizenship. So we're gonna spend the first part talking about the book, talking to, ne to Nico about her methodology and the book, and then we'll shift to Mario, Ryan, and R Ruby. So I just want you all to understand how, how the structure is going. We only have an hour and there's plenty to talk about. All right, so this is a, 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 an extraordinary book. I just wanna, and I'm not just saying that everybody, I want you to all really take this book seriously and go out and get it. Um, it is uh, introducing all sorts of issues, ideas, case studies, um, discussions that are currently going on, and it kind of connects them through the issue of how to um, deal with the museum as what Nico calls the an ecosystem, um, and how. Um, so yeah, so she and she has in, invited um, forty people who are cultural innovators and change makers, as it says, to discuss these issues. And this is one of the things that I find really wonderful about the book is that it is, uh, excuse me for a moment, um, is that 
it's it, it's it's like these NSEs. It's created around discussions. It's created around conversations. It's created around people's personal experiences. Um, it is not a book that talks at you. It is a book that you read, and Nika will talk about this, but her in her introduction, she really addresses the reader and says, this is for you. You have the choice to read through all of these people and their stories and what they're talking about. Um, and the work is up to you. This, so this is not a book that you read to get answers, even though there are answers in there, um, but a, 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 a book that you read actively. So uh, the next slide, please. Um, and this is the wonderful group of people that are in the book. Nico is is a wonderful people person. <laughs> and oh, <thanks. laughs> yes, you are. And um, and so she's brought people together and the the, the discussions are very intimate, very personal. Um, and I also wanted to mention that one of the the um, issue, one of the things that 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 inspired the book was Nico reading Renato Rosaldo's, uh, who's an anthropologist, notion of thinking about cultural citizenship, um, where Rosaldo says, even in contexts of inequality, people have a right to their distinctive heritage. So the book is um, driven by that ethos and the idea of the, of the museum as citizen is one of the topics we'll talk about. Okay, next slide, please. So here's the overview, so you get a sense of it, right? It's three parts. It's also, um, excuse my cat's butt. Um, <laughs> it's it's also um, it's a it's a small book, right? It's um, uh, and and it's split up into these three sections. So the part one is what we'll mostly be dealing with and talking about today. It's where Mario, Ryan, and Ruby appear. Um, and they are roundtables with practitioners. Uh, the second is case studies that documents case studies and actual collaboration, uh, prompting mu museums to invest in both hyperlocal relationships and cross sector partnerships. For that section, what we're going to try to do is use the links in the Brooklyn Rail and give you links to some of the, 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 the folks and institutions that are there. And then the last section is for interviews with major um, thought leaders in this in this. So next slide, I will now um, this let Miss Nico, who I met through the Brooklyn Rail, I want you all to know, she came to me true. Um, through a recommendation as a writer, and she's a natural writer, and it was just extraordinary, and we've become friends, so it's just a part of the Brooklyn Rail family, basically. So Nico, why don't you talk to us now about the book, how it came together, and yep. we can talk about methodology. Um, as you thank you, there's a, thank you, everyone. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay on my my internets here. Um, yeah, thank you all for Did Nico N Nico um, and so oh. uh -oh. Hello? Yeah, we're having a bit We had a, a brief cutout, but Oh, no. Seems better. Okay, are, are we good? So start okay. all over. <laughs> Thank you, is basically what I was saying. Um, yeah, you know, I was just shouting out the Brooklyn Rail for being a longtime supporter of and platform for my work, not just writing. Um, so really happy to be back home here with y'all today. Um, and like immense, immense gratitude to Ruby, Ryan, Mario, um, for sharing not only this space today, uh, but also all your contributions to the book and like your contributions to the field and to everything. I just, I love and respect all three of you a lot. So thank you for being here. Um, this is a photo of me on like a very good day, um, not today. Um, yeah, and you know, not trying to like go on too much about my professional background, but just to orient you, you know, uh, alongside myself in terms of how I relate to this work. Um, so, you know, in the past um, have served in these kind of nonprofit artist founded, culturally specific institutions. Um, that's very much my grounding and my orientation. 
Um, and so all of the experiences around which the book is scaffolded, you know, kind of also adopt um, that lens as well, because that's that's where this work has taken place um, for me. And so I say that to say that that's very different um, from some of the museum kind of superstructure that we critique through the book, because I've never worked at a Met or a MoMA, um, very much by choice and by design. Um, and so what I love about uh, this book and how it's compiled is, you know, the opportunity to kind of bring voices together that are typically excluded from scholarships, uh, from, you know, books about museums, um, just because of who kind of owns those platforms for scholarship. Um, and yeah, can I have the next slide, please? So just to give you a bit of grounding in terms of like why the book even exists. Um, so I started in museums in 2007 um, as a curatorial intern at the Studio Museum in Harlem. I am not a museum person. I don't come from a city or a family or a culture of like going to museums every day. Um, it very much was the specific mission of the Studio Museum that drew me to museum work in the first place. Um, and so, you know, I love what Lauren Kelly in the book calls like black planets and black reservations. Like that's what the Studio Museum embodied for me um, as someone really looking to like build and understand and, you know, kind of make meaning in community with practitioners of color, right? So not just artists. I self-identified as an artist first. That's how I got here, um, not through an art historical path. Um, but then also thinking, you know, all of the people that are a part of, of that ecosystem within the museum. So curators, writers, um, literally every department and being really excited to kind of ground my understanding of the importance of museum work um, in the history of this amazing institution. Um, next slide, please. So, like I said, I started in 2007 at the museum and curatorial. I like went and had a whole life, which we could talk about another day. Um, came back to the museum in 2014 um, uh, as the director of public programs and community engagement. So whole different department, whole set of experiences, um, including getting my master's in London, living there for a while, um, you know, leading Rush Arts Gallery down in Chelsea, um, and, you know, really being excited to kind of carry those experiences with me um, going back to the museum in this moment of like, radical reinvention. Um, and I say that because this was on the eve of the museum deciding to close its doors um, as part of the building project and capital campaign, um, you know, to rebuild in the exact same spot. And so knowing that all of this was coming, this opportunity to ground again within an institution that I love, um, you know, but that was also like on the precipice of, you know, again, advancing change within the field felt really, really important. Um, and so I start with this image on the top left, because this was kind of like the state of things when I landed back at the museum, which, you know, the museum has in its mission, dynamic exchange of art, about art and ideas. And for me, this was like the least dynamic paradigm I could imagine, right? Like <laughs> everyone kind of looking at a stage, expertise emanating from the stage. And this was the convention. I'm not like giving the studio museum a hard time because most museums, have these Thursday evening programs where you all sit and just get spoken at and then you go home and you're like, okay, cool. Um, and so over the course of five years with the support of my amazing team, you know, was really thinking through how we activate these other spaces in the museum, the atrium space probably being the top right image being the most exciting for its kind of, you know, like direct link to the street and the idea that people could literally walk by, see something going on and be like, you know what, I wanna go get involved. Um, and yeah, just thinking through all the ways in which we can kind of remove the distance between art and artists and audiences, um, which I think, you know, became a really real <laughs> reality for everyone um, in 2018 when we actually shut the doors. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Uh, ne yep, thank you. Um, so these are just a couple of images from the In Harlem Initiative, which I was lucky to be a part of, uh, you know, both ideating and mobilizing at the Studio Museum during my time there. It's ongoing, so this is historical work for me. It's not historical work for the institution. Um, but you know, as you can see in the top image, it says Rudy Shepard, part of a performance in Jackie Robinson Park. And the bottom image is Simone Lee, her very first public art installation in Marcus Garvey Park. Um, and what I love about the bottom image is, you know, you can see and feel how the engagement with artwork shifts, right? It's someone's actually physically allowed and invited 
to touch the work as a means of understanding it. It's literally like in someone's yard, like backyard. And so, you know, it becomes a part of your everyday life. Um, there's like a, an ownership over, you know, both the experience and the object that really centers communities. Um, and so this was like the moment of excitement during which the book was conceived, right? Which was like, how do we document this kind of like unprecedented moment <laughs> um, for the museum? Knowing that, you know, it's also taking place elsewhere. There's not a whole lot of like examples in the past to point to in terms of museums pushing beyond their physical walls, um, you know, but also their comfort zone in terms of really trying to like deeply engage audiences and fold them into the mission uh, of the work. And so for me, this is where cultural citizenship like came from, right? Like, you know, I've been studying it theoretically, conceptually before, but this was like, hold on, like we're about to be in Harlem <laughs> in a way that like we actually haven't been in Harlem before. Um, what, is that, what does that mean? How do we do that? Like, how do we prepare for that work? How does that work sustain beyond these like iterative engagements? Like, what does it mean to actually be a citizen of this place that we call home? Um, so that's really where it started. And then from there, it kind of exploded into a bunch of different directions, which included me leaving the studio museum, leaving like the museum world basically altogether, aside from the ways in which I support artists ongoing um, and, you know, through my consulting. Yeah. A moment to say, this isn't just about documenting in Harlem, it's actually about all of the amazing people doing work similarly elsewhere um, and really kind of holding it all in relation to each other um, as like evidence and as proof <laughs> in the world um, for people that are looking for, um, I don't know, um, permission to, to work differently, to work against the grain um, and thinking that it would be a resource, you know, not just for people working inside museums, um, but also communities that wanna see themselves more fully reflected in museums. So I'm gonna shut up um, okay. because that's, that's really okay. all I wanna say. That was beautiful um, because this is, the, the book is very rooted, as I said, in everybody's personal experience. And we'll hear about that from uh, Ryan and, and, and Ruby as well as Mario. But uh, this quote she uses at the beginning um, by Ju June Jordan to talk about many people in the book talk about their experiences, their first initiation into the museum. Um, and uh, often traumatic, often not feeling like one was recognized. And uh, one person does talk about the importance of Thelma Golden's Black Male Show. Thelma Golden, for those who I'm sure everybody knows, she's the director of the Studio Museum where Nico was working. So um, June Jordan has been, was, was addressing this uh, way before this moment when actually issues around the museum and equity and diversity um, are really um, on everybody's radar, or should be. Uh, anyway, so the next slide, please, is to go to the book. And this is part of what, um, these are four of the critical concepts that Nico um, uses as a way to sort of introduce th the three parts. And so Nico, is there anything in these four concepts, five concepts, that you want to emphasize? Um... Not really. I mean, I just wanted to ground people in my like chosen definition of each of the words comprising the Good. title. Because I think as an educator, you know, I'm like, I don't mean it in every way. I mean it in this way. Exactly. Um, but exactly. yeah, no, I think, you know, an emphasis on the change piece, even though it's probably the simplest definition, <laughs> um, you know, but that the book itself is about transformation and about how that occurs and who is necessary to that process and like understanding it, you know, on a spectrum of scales. Okay, the next slide we is a quote that I pulled from the book by Nico because this is shows you the nature of the book. As I mentioned, the book is is not a, an answer so much as a, as a series of conversations that one draws from. So she says, the choice is yours as to how, where, and whether you apply the tools shared in the book. Because Nico talks about the book as a toolkit. So consider this toolkit an infinitely evolving repository, and I love this, of actionable ideas 
rather than a static set of objects to draw upon and consider this book's existence as evidence of an ecosystem already undergoing rapid yet necessary transformation both under our feet and by our own hands. So that's to give you a flavor of Nico's um, perspective, her methodology and the book itself. So let's move on quickly. We're gonna go over the, the, the three parts. So the first part is called Dialogues on Decentralization. This is the artist, Sean Leonardo. Um, could you show the next slide, please? Uh, which is the chapters. Oh, okay, so sorry. Um, this quote was important for, for you, right, Nico, in the, um, in the book. And the reason I put it up here is that part one is really an emphasis on the artists and the way the book keeps the artist at the center of how the museum can change and what is going on in changing. And in the first um, uh, section that's called Nexus, um, it's about artist residencies and the cap that I have put on my head um, is called, is from um, the wonderful Miguel Luciano had an artist residency at the Met and he made hats and t-shirts among a, a, a beautiful show he did in East Harlem um, where he had been, um, uh, he had gone into the collection. You, you will put the link on, on uh, in the chat so you can go see what Miguel was doing, but I just wanted to sort of sh shout out that and the importance of, um, of, of, of the artist. So to the next slide, um, please. Yeah, okay. So these are Nico's seven chapters, seven sections, and they're beautiful, right? This is just the idea, any one of them. Museum is nexus. Museum is medium is the one we will spend a lot of time with today because that's where Mario and Ryan appear. Museum is citizen, museum is apprentice, museum is bridge, museum is advocate. And then we will end talking with Ruby who is part of the museum as stakeholder section. So again, because we don't have much time, we will move on to the next slide, please. Part two, cases in cultural citizenship. Second, next slide, please. So Nico, if you wanna comment on these, what was going on? What does this section say versus part one? Yeah, I think this is important because it, it really points to specific examples of work in the world that people can look to. So it, it takes up actual initiatives that people were a part of building and just kind of analyzes them like postmortem, right? So it's like, these are the successes, these are the failures, this is what we learned. Um, and I think the transparency that people share, you know, the way with which they're kind of thinking about integrating these into their respective museums um, is like super refreshing because um, I don't think there's that many <laughs> examples in the world of, of the failures. And so I think being able to kind of um, celebrate that, right, and celebrate it in conversation as opposed to like a polished case study, you know, that you go and try and adapt um, felt most honest. Um, and so, yeah, what was interesting was, you know, I was actually part of the first two during my time at studio, um, but the last two, you know, completely didn't touch any aspect of my work at all. These are people that I know and love from afar. And so it was exciting to also have um, that kind of orientation within the book as well. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Next slide, please, part three. So this is the, the third part, perspectives on praxis. Next slide to show, or maybe go back because you might talk about the four people that are in the in the in this image that are interviewed. Yeah. God, I love like seeing them all next to each other. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> this is Nicole Ivy, Ariana Curtis, Delana Dameron, and Sandra Jackson Dumont. And I like say in the introduction to this part that it's like not about positioning them as soloists in front of the choir, which I really mean, even though this slide makes them look like they're in some amazing like fierce group. Um, but you know, it's really about like giving the space and opportunity to go deep on some of the issues that were brought up elsewhere in part one um, and part two as well. So depth as opposed to just breadth. Great. Okay, so now we finally move into our first guest, um, Mario 
uh, Gooden, and we're so pleased to have you here. Um, please put up a, the screenshot. Yes, this is um, his extraordinary book. Again, it's it's also it's 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 tiny but potent and um, really um, innovative in its design and its ideas. Um, and so I'm going to let Mario introduce himself and the work he's been doing as an architect, but I just wanted to um, emphasize that his perspective is very philosophical, even though you're, you, Mario, even though you are a practicing um, architect, really coming out of that the history of the museum, right, is, is based on a European epistemology that's based on the white male body. And I really like the way he, you talk about it's the, the, the museum is built around specific kinds of bodies. This ties into Nico's book, which again is very personal about very personal experiences. Um, and that body is the white male subject. So this also takes us back to the June Jordan quote and the work in the, in the book and the discussions about people's experiences uh, going to the the museum as, as kids working in the museum, which is what we will get Ryan's um, perspective on and so on and so forth. Um, so enough about me uh, talking. Let's introduce, let's, uh, Mario, why don't you take over for a bit? Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Theresa. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be here this afternoon. And I really want to, um, to thank Nico again for um, asking me to be a part of this project and to be in conversation with Nico around the the concept of museum as as medium, and um, yes, I, I suppose you know my position comes from the let's say architectural history and architectural theory, although I'm not a historian, um, but beginning to think about you know and I'll tie this into the the concept of cultural citizen. Um, you know, so who is that subject, or who is this? Who is the citizen? Um, and you know, this is an image from uh, protests in 1960 at the Brooks Memorial Art Gallery in Memphis, um, where uh, a group of students uh, entered the museum, asked to see um, uh, one of the permanent collections at the at the gallery, and were subsequently arrested. Um, because they were, they had shown up on not the designated day, which was Negro Thursdays, um, and so this question of who is citizen, who is who is the subject, um, and you know, museums have historically been a place of exclusion, although uh, I would say that museums are also historically places of extraction or places that have collected what was extracted from other cultures, whether or not it was ancient Egypt, or we can think about the um, Benin bronzes, or go to the Met and, and question, well, where did these things come from? I was just in Berlin uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you know, it always surprises me to see the bust of Nefertiti at the Neue Museum. Like, how the heck did this get here? Why is that, why is that here? Um, when, in fact, uh, people of color were for a long time excluded from museum. And this is a piece by uh, Fred Wilson called Guard of View. Um, you know, if we walk into the Met on most days, you know, we are used to seeing, if we see people of color, not at, only at the Met, but let's say at the moment, they are the security people. Um, so, I, so this is a really potent uh, piece by Fred. Can we go to the next, next slide? Uh, but African American museums, which is um, one of the subjects of, of the book Dark Space, really began as, I would say, community um, centers or community initiatives. This is a, a photograph, and I have to um, credit my colleague Mabel Wilson, who included this in her book on Negro building. Um, uh, this is the original International African American Museum in Detroit, which was a kind of mobile museum, but a mobile museum that brought the community together. Uh, it was also a place in which um, uh, people registered to vote. That was active in in uh, you know in the movement for for voting rights in the 1960s. Um, next image. Um, but something really important, I think, happened um, here in 2020, uh, two years ago, of course, at the height of um, 
the protests, you know, around the country, even around the world, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd and the remembrance of Breonna Taylor, um, author Jaffa made available his film, uh, Love is the Message and Message is Death, that was free for 24, for 48 hours uh, across 13 museums or 11 museums internationally. Um, and what was really significant about this is that no one had to pay an entry fee to go into a museum. Oftentimes museums are quite intimidating, one because of their architectural nature. So you can imagine walking up the steps to the Met, for example, um, but also entry fees. I don't even know how much moment is now. I think it's at least $25, maybe more than that to, to, to get in. But entry fees are also exorbitant. But AJ made this film, um, you know, which is a film about the, the beauty of blackness, the phantasmagoria of blackness, the, it is everything about blackness, but made it available for 48 hours uh, at these different museums around the world. And um, anyone could watch it. And it, ex it, if you will, I'll go, go back to that June Jordan quote, essentially blew up the museum for 48 hours in terms of turning it inside out and making it a kind of global inside out phenomenon. Um, I don't know if we have enough time here. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, there is a little clip of- uh, I'd like to show the, the clip. Message, yeah. The message is death. Maybe we, if we have a minute, I think it's only about a minute long. Um, and uh, this is all that's online, but the next time that um, I would say to the audience that it is available, um, you know, the, or on exhibit anywhere, please rush in and see it. But um, let's see if this will play. I don't think the video is inside the slideshow. Oh, it should be. Maybe we can put a link to it. Maybe we can put a, a link to it. It is at, um, uh, this clip is at Vimeo. So maybe we can put a link to it at Gavin Brown's Vimeo. I will do that now. Okay, great. There, uh, and I, there's I, also on, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just want to mention, uh, there's also online these extraordinary many conversations between Arthur Jaffa and the late Greg Tate about this film. There's one that I watched where they went through a kind of shot by shot discussion. Um, and I, I, so people should also look for those as well. Yes, yeah, that, yes, that's right, thanks. Um, and my, my I, in addition to, you know, my academic hat, I'm also a practicing architect. Um, my, my studio, we're currently working on the Woodson African American Museum of Florida, uh, which is in St. Petersburg. And there we're looking at some of these very concepts of how to turn the museum inside out, how to, let's say, dematerialize the, the, the typology and make the museum something which is much more inviting rather than something which is, uh, than a building that is intimidating in terms of its, its architectural presence. And we can just kind of move through these. Um, Eleanor, I mean, what's interesting about, you know, the site for this, this project is that it's um, in an African American neighborhood um, that was severed by um, urban renewal, severed by a, a freeway that runs through the, through the middle of it. Um, and what we were looking to do is, is thinking about how to stitch uh, the community back together. Um, but oftentimes we begin by looking at work that you might find in a museum. Um, so this is Romare Bearden's um, Jazz Village, um, which was, a, I would say, a kind of inspiration in terms of thinking about the vibrancy the non-static condition, if you will, of cultural production. And, and that is something that we're quite interested in. I, again, Eleanor, we can move through these kind of quickly. This just kind of gives everyone a kind of sense of the, you know, of the urban fabric. So you see there's I-275, the, the paired lines, uh, the highway that's coming through there. And we're trying to think about how to reconnect to the, to the much denser fabric. Um, we can keep going. Um, we we're also um, uh, looking at, you know, as we think about the museum as a place of cultural production, we're also not only looking at painting, but also looking at performance. This is actually 
uh, clip it or snip it from uh, that we analyzed from uh, a film called Black and Tan. This is Duke Ellington in 1929. It's a short film about 12 minutes um, with Duke Ellington and Freddie Washington that also played a part in how we're thinking about designing the museum. Um, if we go to the next slide here, you can begin to see, and we've tried to, let's say, color code some things where the, you see the blue and the orange and the purple are actually coming into the museum. These are the exterior spaces, the exterior terraces, um, uh, gathering spaces, which actually come in and co-mingle with interior spaces. And um, we'll just keep going through. I won't speak to each of these slides, but I think it's, you know, thinking about the museum, uh, particularly, you know, within the last few years, how can um, we reconceptualize what a museum is? Because I would say that the museum has been complicit, you know, mm -hmm. in certain structures of power and in the colonialism that have been, uh, that have affected a number of different places, as well as, the, as, as imperialism. Um, these museums, I would say, have been part of that colonial project. Um, so, you know, the discussion that Nico and, uh, and I had along with um, the Dean at the Yale School of Architecture, um, you know, was very much about, you know, architecture and thinking about the museum as this typology and how to transform, um, how to transform the museum from what it was to a potential of what it might be or what it, or how it would perform, not as a static condition, but as an active condition and as a part of the community. Also, you were the one who, in your discussion, came up with the idea of, or could the museum become more of a medium than an object, which is what then she named that. Um, um, and she she mentions, and this is part of the larger discussion, but that um, as a practicing architect, you, you've you moved away from, you, you're interested not in it so much as promoting the care of the objects, but as the people that are coming into the museum. So looking at it, would you talk a bit more about this idea of the museum as a place of production rather than about the object, if you can, you mention that? Sure, sure, sure. Um, yes, I mean, I think, you know, most museums, and I, I think we discussed um, this as well, and Nico, you should also chime in. This is the conversation that we're having with Deborah. Deborah Burke is the Dean at the Yale School of Architecture. Um, you know, most of what's on view at museums is only a small percentage of its, of its collection. Um, the majority of the collection is, is out of view. So here are these objects that have been acquired, um, some by whatever means, um, you know, some by you know, suspicious means even, um, but you know, the emphasis always seems to be on the object rather than the, uh, I would say, the cultures that the objects have come from or the cultures in which now the objects find themselves. Mm -hmm. um, over you know, the last several years, you know, a number of museums you know, have been making an, an effort, I think, to, uh, to incorporate, um, let's say, performance as part of what the museum does. Um, to uh, engage the communities in a, in a different way. So I can think of the, um, the Underground Museum in Los Angeles, which sadly it is no more, the California African American Museum in Los Angeles. You know, these are, were and are museums which um, are about, I guess I would use the word community care um, and bring the community together to think about the individual and the way in which art becomes a part of healing and a part of care, rather than art as a kind of static thing to be admired um, and uh, to be admired and, and revered. Um, if we think about most cultures, um, and perhaps these were objects which were not necessarily thought of as art, they were, but these things were utilitarian, they were everyday objects. Um, now those have been, let's say, co-opted or transformed into uh, these static objects, but they were actually always, so we can think about, uh, 
objects that have been collected or extracted from the African continent or from Asia, most of these objects were actually part of daily life and were, and were used uh, by people. They were not simply uh, aesthetic objects to be gazed upon, but were to be used and, uh, and, and part of the performance of everyday life. So this is one thing that I've been really kind of interested in is to think about the ways in which not only museums, but the way in which architecture performs rather than what it looks like and how it separates itself in terms of the, the gaze of the subject and the, and the object of art, but how are these things engaged and what are the enmeshed conditions of, you know, I would say of everyday practice relative to art and art making. Fantastic. Yeah. And you mentioned in the um, in the discussion, the 1992 Fred Wilson um, groundbreaking um, exhibition, Mining the Museum, um, where which do you want to mention a little bit of that? Because there's this moment in the discussion where he had found uh, one. I don't think I couldn't it's a goblet, it's a silver something. But then they went into the Met and found that there were like 500 of the, those, those items. So maybe just mention a little bit for people who aren't that familiar with the Fred Wilson as an artist, what he did with the museum. Or maybe it's Nico who spoke about that. So maybe Nico. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say, I mean, I think I just, re I just reference it. Um, you know, because again, for me, the importance of that reference was that it was an artist's instigation that then prompted or forced the museum to audit its practices, right? It wasn't the institution saying, look at all this stuff that we hold, like, why do we hold it? How do we present it? It was an artist with the provocation. And so I think that goes back to kind of the original concept and framing of the book, which is like, look at the work artists are doing <laughs> to encourage us to move beyond these kind of inherited practices and structures. Yeah, and, and since okay. uh, that, that piece, um, there have been a, you know, a few museums that have actually asked artists to come in and mm -hmm. look at their collections and actually curate from their collections. My uh, former partner, Ray Huff, and I were involved in a similar project in, in South Carolina and Charleston, of all places, at, at the Gibbs Museum there, whose collection was primary collection of, I would say, antebellum portraiture. And we were asked to, uh, to examine their collection and to somehow engage with it in a way that would invite others to kind of think about the South in a different way. And so mm -hmm. we went through their collection with a kind of architectural lens and then mounted the works in a way in which they were not usually seen. So we took them off the wall, mounted them in the, in the middle of the space and then created a dialogue about that. So I think, you know, what, Fred Wilson did in terms of mining the museum uh, you know, has actually instigated other okay. museums to really think about their collections and their practices. Okay, which brings me to um, the next person that we are going to speak with, which is Ryan Dennis. Um, welcome. She is the Chief Curator and Artistic Director of the Center for Art and Public Exchange at the Mississippi Museum of Art. And Ryan, we are really pleased to have you here. And we know that you are in Jackson and that right now um, we, our thoughts are with you um, and with um, everybody in that city for the awful situation with water that's going on there. So um, I just wanted to, to mention that. and and. As a practitioner, as a curator, um, I'd like you to talk about your experience working with the Mississippi Museum of Art. Um, again, personally, you know, in terms of who is the audience, um, um, what is the mission, and maybe <laughs> highlight some of the, the good experiences you've had and some of the bad experiences you've had as, as a curator. Um, sure. Um, first, thank you so much. And of course, thank you, Nico, for the invitation and your friendship um, Love you. Love you. <laughs> um, over the years. I guess before I answer the question, I do um, want to just um, say that if people are interested in donating water or funds to support what's going on here, um, the ACLU Mississippi um, and the Mississippi Today News is really sharing out a lot of resources um, for um, people to stay plugged in. 
Um, there are a few artists too that are about to open up their studios um, to start kind of um, sharing and donating, uh, distributing water um, uh, throughout the city. So um, just trying to think about reliable resources for sharing, um, uh, for sharing resources and, and water distribution throughout the city, which obviously should not be happening, but it is. And, um, uh, and it's connected to everything we're talking about here, I mean, right, the deeper structures. Um, so exactly. completely. So thank you again for being here. Yeah, really appreciate it. Um, of course. So yeah, I've been um, I've been at the Mississippi Museum of Art for two years now. Um, I moved here in the middle of a pandemic um, that we're still, you know, obviously going through. Um, and I will, you know, the Mississippi Museum of Art um, has been working in many ways to connect to its hyperlocal community. I think, you know, the draw for Betsy Bradley, who is our director, to, you know, bring me to this institution is to work more concretely with um, the hyperlocal community. You know, Jackson is 85% African American. The museum has uh, historically been a bit disconnected from, <laughs> from the local community here. And, um, you know, my work is, um, is really informed by my time at Project Row Houses, um, which is a community-based arts organization in Houston. Um, I worked there for eight years. I volunteered there when I was a, an undergrad um, at the University of Houston while uh, also being a curatorial assistant at the Manil Collection. So I've always had a really deep interest in, um, in not just audiences, but like who are our citizens and who are the communities in which like these institutions are centrally located. Um, you know, Mario, you brought up the the kind of um, the idea of like community care, and you know, I think the Underground Museum and the California African American Museum, and also say Studio or the Laundromat or uh, Studio and Project Row Houses and the Laundromat Project, like these are all kind of culturally specific institutions. And in some ways I'm arguing and hoping that museums get to the point where they understand that they're like, they are also responsible for caring for the communities in which they, you know, um, <laughs> operate from. So my, um, my time here has, um, has been interesting. I mean, you know, moving to a place where the city is essentially shut down, but also um, uh, kind of like dealing with resources and those exchanges have been a kind of fascinating investigation. Um, but we do have a collection of about 5,000 objects. Um, that are typically, of course, not shown as Mario shared. Um, uh, but you know, I've been I've been thinking a lot about how to um, just connect with neighbors, and that looks like that looks like um, initiating block walking, <laughs> which is you know a very um, uh, strategies and 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 politics and 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 you know introducing yourself to your neighbors and various communities and um trying to kind of get our staff on board to um make some shifts internally to um to go block walking and understand who our neighbors are and what resources that they need and just like introduce ourselves to people and invite them into the museum um do, and, do other people at the museum join you is other museum staff or is it mostly just you uh, doing that <laughs> uh well i um launched a kind of initiative so it is my department um uh, curatorial and the education team and it's actually opened up to mm -hmm. other departments who have become really interested in um, wanting to block walk so you know even that is a is a is a is an important but strategic um kind of process to engage my staff with like the team because 
you know, you want to be careful. Like these are people's lives. They're, you know, they're, yeah. they're not necessarily trusting of the institution because they don't know the institution yeah. yet. So building these relationships have been really important to me. I mean, I tend to carry like a stack of, um, <laughs> like a stack of, um, uh, tickets and just distribute them when say I'm at Target or when I go to yeah. Home Depot or you know just to that's where the people are I mean that's where people exactly exist right. and I want to be able to let them know like you are welcome into this space and maybe if the means is the thing that keeps you out of this space then let's like here you know here are things that here are tickets to get you into the space. And when they get into the space, I want them to be able to see themselves in that space. So what does radical hospitality look like? We've been doing a lot of kind of training on that with our staff and um, also just through exhibitions and public programs, right? Really um, uh, wanting folks to understand the value of say an, an object, but artist and the conversations that they're contributing to a space is in fact for the people that live in a place like Jackson, right? So, um, so much of, yeah, so much of, I think my background has informed how I move within uh, the space at the Mississippi Museum of Art. And, you know, I'm, I'm a chief, I'm the chief curator, but I'm also the artistic director for the Center for Art and Public Exchange, but I'm in very close kind of proximity and um, and dialogue with our education department. And so, how do you you know work within these institutions to really break down silos as well? And so, I've been working on working on that a lot, um, which just takes time because institutions have been conditioned to work in a certain type of way. Um, Nico, Nico and the many voices break this down, you know, in this mm -hmm. book, and it's, um, it's so valuable to understand, like, um, the elements in which we're operating under, and it's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not that institutions are inherently bad, it's that mm -hmm. we also have to be mindful of, like, the leadership, um, and the people who are occupying space within the institutions, and um, disentangle that quite a bit, right? This is exactly, and this is actually a fantastic segue into into Ruby Learner. But I um, I uh, ask people to look in the links and follow more of what Ryan has done because we we hardly even are touching the surface of shows you've done and things you've written and so on and so forth. So um, Ruby Learner, in some ways, it does not need to be introduced, but um, the founding um, director of, of, of Creative Capital, among a million other things. And the reason that um, she is in a section on the museum is stakeholder. And that's why this is a perfect moment to move into and also why I asked Ryan to talk a bit about did other people in the museum come in, the ways that the people in power, the people who raise money, the people so on and so forth are 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 um, uh, involved in this, and it isn't just you know the curators and the artists of color, but that it becomes a larger project. So, I put this quote in here because there's this marvelous moment when Ruby mentions, um, and if you that you sometimes instead of talking about issues around failure, you you say you want to make a T-shirt that says "Don't mind me, I'm just iterating." So if we could bring up Ruby, um, and I would really appreciate hearing from you again, um, your, your personal history as a stakeholder and all that you have done. But I also was very interested in your personal history as a, as a white woman working on issues of diversity and equity for, for a long time. Um, and I just wanted to mention, because I don't want to forget it, is that um, Ryan, there was this moment when you were mentioning um, the the ideas of, of the museum and care. In the book, there's this moment when Vashti du, du Bois, um, talk, who is the uh, founder of the Colored Girls Museum, talks about it as a public health clinic, literally almost, right? And so thinking about ways that we can work around cultural citizenship, emotional health, 
community reaching out and so on and so forth. Um, and from therefore, Ruby, take it away. <laughs> um, well, my history is really in um, mostly in um, community based organizations. I was the director at Alternate Roots for um, a number of years, and then I ended up in the independent film world running membership organizations. So they're very rooted in how do you serve a community? So that has sort of always been uh, my orientation. And so when I got to Creative Capital, that was still my orientation. And I think of com Creative Capital as really a, a community-based organization. I know a lot of people probably don't see it that way, but that's that's my orientation. And so that's what I really wanted to build. And a lot of the rhetoric um, is uh, of Creative Capital from, from my time and from setting it up was really about community, building a community of artists, and connecting that community of artists with a wider community of professionals. So we were not a uh, presenter or producer ourselves. And so, you know, we reached a wider audience, I think, I hope, by being, um, you know, active online and creating um, uh, really great um, visibility for the artists that we supported. Um, you know, I have not worked in in really in major institutions and maybe I, I'm too skeptical. I hope I'm too skeptical. Uh, what gave me hope and uh, uh, you know reading the book is that so many people who are are interviewed, like like Ryan is a perfect example of somebody who comes from a community orientation. Um, you know, I think I was a shock when I got hired at at um, um, creative capital because I, I didn't come from the visual arts world. The visual arts world didn't have a clue who I was. I came from the performing arts world and from the, the independent media world. And so it, which are, which are very different than, um, than the visual arts world. So I have a lot of skepticism about institutions. And while I want to agree with Ryan that they're not inherently bad places <laughs> um, <laughs> in practice, um, I think we see something that's a little bit different, particularly in terms of the power dynamic around um, uh, boards and, and staff hierarchies. And, you know, that structure, that sort of corporate structure is derived from the church, it's derived from the military, it's patriarchal, it's hierarchical. And I, I think you have to ask, well, who does that structure serve and what does that structure serve? Mm -hmm. And usually it serves the status quo really well. It's an adaptive structure in the sense that I believe you do see these, these changes and I don't want to um, minimize them because I think they've been important and you do see forward uh, movement. But I wonder to what extent the institution is just absorbing that critique and then, you know, um, you know, sort of doing what is uh, what seems to be necessary at a moment without actually impacting the ultimate power dynamic in the institution. Exactly. This is something, you know, this is something I, I really wonder about and think about a lot. For me, I've never been more excited and more hopeful about what's going on in the field. Uh, but the reason is because we have all of the, we have this incredible pluralism now. We do have all of these structures that are um, that are out there. We have these culturally specific organizations. We have organizations. I was just reading about a cafe in Troy, New York, uh, that was um, that it, that is run collectively by trans people, and they have a very very smart business plan for the future. I mean, these alternate structures are things that also really interest me because they talk about who's the owner here, um, mm. and so I think we we have we're in a moment of incredible opportunity to revisit a lot of stuff, um, and to and to then make sure that the resources are equitably distributed across these, mm -hmm. um, you know, this, this wide and vast and glorious field that they're, that the huge institutions don't just suck up all the resources. Um, mm -hmm. So that for me, those are things that, that I'm thinking about now, you know, and so I loved the, in the book, uh, someone talks about equity versus equality. And I think that's, that's a really mm -hmm. important uh, conceptual frame. I was sort of raised on, you know, the democratization of culture, which is usually the mm -hmm. high culture versus cultural democracy, which I think is what I think June Jordan was talking about. And so these are these are things that I think can be um, juxtaposed in ways and in, in healthy ways to bring certain things to the fore. 
Mario, you, well, your presentation was so amazing. And when you showed the museum that you built, which you showed, you know, the the outside of the building, and and I, you had shown us the um, African American Museum on Wheels, and I thought, oh my gosh, you could put wheels on the museum that Mario <laughs> built because it it had that feel to it, which mm -hmm. I thought was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Maybe should we should be evaluating um, these institutions that we have on how close they are to mm -hmm. a structure like the um, uh, you know the Museum on Wheels. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be a whole different um, a kind of um, hierarchy if we did that. It would be a different okay. hierarchy if we asked artists to talk about you know if artists were ranking organizations the most the organizations that have been the most important to them you know, I think you'd get, again, a very different, um, you get a very different picture. So for me, I'm really interested in how do you build from the grassroots um, up and how do you make sure that, uh, oh my God, somebody's talking about libraries on wheels. <gasps> I used to go, I, I grew up in Western North Carolina and I used to go out with the woman who ran the bookmobile and I used to go yeah. into little valleys and hollows right outside of uh, where I grew up in Western North Carolina. I mean, I saw everything with her. It was an actually amazing. Yes, libraries on wheels. So the bookmobiles. Um, anyway, what, um, you know, we are in this incredibly generative moment. How do we make sure that the things that are most generative are, are, are capturing an equitable portion of the resources? I mean, these are the questions that, that I think about a lot. <laughs> One of the things that I thought was fantastic that you spoke about was the idea of financial literacy, which is something I never really learned myself, right? right. Um, again, and this goes back to the book, um, if you could bring up the, the last slide that we had up here about, you know, going back to this idea that this book is, is, is tools, right? And that part of what you see with what Ruby is talking about are some of the tools she's gleaned from her experiences. Um, and that the book, Ruby, Ryan, Mario, everybody in the book is investing not just in themselves, but in this idea that is behind uh, Nico's book, an entire, you know, changing the entire, uh, the social change ecosystem, right? Remember, we brought, she brought up originally the idea of the museum as an ecosystem, but then and this goes to what Mario's work is about, uh, you know, th that the museum is 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 a part of this larger, uh, uh, what this larger world that we want to change, and that we're in the process of changing, um, and that that's really what what Nico's book is about. Um, and so Ruby, I was really taken by your talking about um, about financial literacy and making that part of it, but also this idea of, you know, you talk about that it's, you know, stepping aside. And there's moments in the book where um, Jasmine Wahi talks about, you know, that one of the things she's found is that um, people, white people in power don't really want to step aside. And that this is the very, you know, complicated, awkward moment where some people, myself included, have, have, have had to think about that, right? When we step aside and you've been, you talk also about mentorship um, and generational wealth and all of those issues. So, um, you know, part of it is, is, is maybe the age that you're at and that I'm at, but that um, we can step aside, but that, 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 and enter into this dialogue and again going back to the book. So um, I just really appreciate the fact that that you brought that in because that's part of, you know, it's it, this is a book, I keep going back to this, and this is how I want to end and and open up the discussion for everybody, is this idea of tools and of um, everybody who's listening now and everybody who listens to this as a recording, thinking about the ways that they themselves can be activated by Nico's book. Um, so before we open it up to, to general questions or discussion, I'd love to have everybody come out, you know, have Nico and Mario and Ryan and Ruby. And if there's anything that you guys haven't shared yet about what you've learned from, from Nico's book um, or that you would like to add before we move on uh, to the audience, I'd appreciate to hear. 
Ruby, you had mentioned things that, that you had learned from the book. Yeah, you know, um, I the the book was for me a sort of series of um, of um, uh, revelations and the conversations I thought were so rich and I was so happy, for instance, to see architecture in the book. It was uh, for me unexpected um, and it was so great and the conversation was so great um, and and so important because space is is so powerful. And I think, you know, Brian, you were talking about people maybe not coming because they didn't have the means to come financially to attend. But, you know, maybe they're not coming because the building itself is not a welcoming structure, uh, you know, that you don't feel that a lot of people don't feel comfortable, maybe not just people of color, but a lot of it, poor people or people who don't have a college education or a degree in art don't feel comfortable going into culture palaces. They don't feel like homes. Um, I um, had a, a great experience a few years ago in, in New Orleans going into um, you know, a couple of the house museums. And I thought, oh my God, how, all museums should be like this. You know, they feel very accessible. They're very welcoming. They're warm. You know, the family is there to to walk you through what's on display. Well, I mean, wow. You know, I don't feel that when I go as much as I love going to, you know, the big institutions here in New York. That's I don't feel that when I walk in the door. So, you know, could, that's what up. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, that makes me think of the Deborah Burke section in the discussion with Mario. Yeah. And, yeah. and if we, if you, somebody would introduce the work that she's done with the um, hotels. Well, I'm happy to talk about that just quickly because I'm, I, I know the owners quite well and I've spent a lot of time in Louisville and I've just re relay my very first experience walking in the door of, of the hotel there. I did not know where I was. I was completely disoriented. I was like, are we supposed to pay an admission fee? Because I don't know what, the, what is this space? I didn't know. I didn't understand. It was a hotel museum. What is that? But having spent a lot of hours in that hotel over the years and some of the other hotels as well, when you have the experience of seeing people experiencing not, not easy art, often very um, difficult art at 11 o'clock at night, you think, and why are we only open from 10 to five or 10 to six? I mean, like, what, what is, what's going on here? You know, there's a whole other way of being. And, and it was, it's been very inspiring to me to have that experience in a number of their hotels. Mm -hmm. Mika, do you want to talk a little bit more about Deborah Burke for people who don't know what, what the 21C museums are? Sure. Um, and I'm really just going to, I know we're short on time, so um, I would encourage y'all to look it up because there's so many resources related to the many different places those hotels live and the different artists in the collection. But, you know, the premise is really simple, right, which is what you were just saying, Ruby, which is like, how do you incite, um, you know, interactions with art in your everyday life and everyday experience? So the idea is that you could be a guest in this hotel that like wanders down in your pajamas to go get a drink in the middle of the night and, you know, run into like an amazing work of art by, you know, whatever artist, right, is kind of endemic to that place. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I just love that, you know, it's so informal um, and that, you know, the premise of it is that art should actually be and is for everyone. And then it's created about narratives that you know and understand because you're a part of that narrative, right? And so that's what excited me about, you know, bringing Deborah into the conversation as well is like, how do you even get to a place of imagining museums functioning in that way? Like what aspects of the practices need to be shed in order to fit into these kind of more accessible models? And then how can museums in more traditional spaces learn from that adaptability, right? And so I really saw architecture as leading that initiative in a certain kind of way, in addition to like the people with money who own the artworks, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's about space, it's about deconstructing space. And so, yeah, in particular, I was like so excited to be in conversation with, with Mario and Deborah and Mate, because out of all the chapters, it's 100% the thing I know the least about, but that I'm most impacted and shaped by as like a person who leaves my house every day to like <laughs> walk into the built environment, right? And so, yeah, I felt like I would be remiss to not have a chapter that explores how cultural space is constructed, but then also what that means in terms of belonging. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the museum as a space of, of belonging. Um, yeah, which goes to Mario's work and which goes to this idea of, um, 
uh, you know, do we blow up the museums or, you know, the, or better, and I, this is what goes back to how you start the book, that there are already out in the world examples of people doing things right. that are activating a different relationship than to this big honker of a institution um, and, and so forth. So yeah, so I, okay, we're gonna have to end here, but I, we have to put up the slide that gives the discount so that people can go and uh, get get Nico's book. Um, but was there love a to question open it up from now. someone in the audience? Yeah, that's what we're opening it up to now. Okay, the cool. Questions and audience. I thought I saw or just something comments. from GE yeah. Schwartz. Hi. Yeah, um, thank you so, so much, everyone. It's been a really illuminating discussion. I'm so, so much to think about. Um, everybody, yeah, definitely make sure to write down this code for a discount on the book. It's very generous. Um, and we do have a question from our friend GE. Um, GE, you should be able to unmute now to ask your question. Thank you so very much, Eleanor, and, and, and wonderful panel today. And it seems as though this book, even this design seems to be able to maybe activate in so many ways um, and be one of those handbooks that will just be around for a long, long time. My question is, in thinking about radical hospitality, which is just something I've been very much involved with for myself for a long, long time, many, many places, and radical hospitality in museums, isn't it call to radical hospitality, not to dump the entire host cup, as they say, on individuals, but to offer the community of uh, potential guests sips to give them taste on their journey to these encounters and observations, and then hopefully activism at various museums and places of museums. Oh, um. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I brought up maybe radical hospitality. So I, yes, I did. think yes. <laughs> I think the um, that's that's the thing that sparked me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think <laughs> radical hospitality could look, you know, a number of different ways. But uh, you know, I think it's important for institutions to understand how they are welcoming people into their spaces. And you know, Ruby, you spoke about you know you know, people may, might not come in because of the architecture of the building, which I completely agree, but like you can, you know, how, how do you feel welcome in a space? I mean, how do I want people to feel when they enter into my home? I think that these principles are at times so kind of like disconnected because we're in an institution like a museum and it has to be like this or like that and it does not I mean those are conditions that can be shifted and changed so I think that you know I think radical hospitality looks like care work I think it's it looks like people-centered work I think it looks like you know um, training your security team to you know not maybe following visitors around as if they've never been into a museum before. I think it looks like, you know, greeting and baseline welcoming. Um, that really shifts people's movement in space in more ways than we really know. I mean, it, you know, it, it's so interesting because sometimes I think about like the basic the, like just the base level of things that need to shift in, in museums. And it seems like so like almost like these no brainers, but it really does. <laughs> there is a lot to, um, I forgot which rap group said, even my condition has been conditioned, but like literally, <laughs> you know, there is um, the conditions of the museum's conditions have been so conditioned that like, it is time, which we're seeing slowly, um, that that it's it's broken down in ways. And so I think you know Mario's presentation of like even a, a museum on wheels that is radical hospitality, right? Like yeah. there are there are opportunities here to um, just let people know like you're part of this place. 
if if institutions want them to be. I mean, I think that's the <laughs> that's the crux of it all too. It's a it's almost like a value system and how identifying what institutions values are, which are very different. We're we're talking about like museums capital M, but like there are many types of museums and they don't look just like a development of a patriarchy or you know what I mean like they are there are new developments that are happening within institution building that I think is important to um to recognize and 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 like give weight to that as well can I build on that just a little bit because when you said it I like wrote it down and then circled it many many times <laughs> um because I was excited by it as like I'm trying to visualize the practice um and it reminded me of the very first chapter of the book being in discussion um, where Jordan Castile was talking about what she does when she enters a new community and like how her mother has conditioned and trained her to get to know the people that have come before you, but also that you're going to like coexist among. And so she was talking about, you know, like catching her mom like outside chain smoking with like the couple of people that lived on either side of the place that she had just started renting which like evoked this idea, like this image in my mind that was like, yeah, what would it look like for a museum to be like out on its stoop, like sitting, <laughs> talking shop, like, you know, chain smoking with whoever, you know, its neighbors are, which is, it was like super provocative to me as like a thought, but it's like, I think to consider hospitality, not just how you welcome people in, but like how you exist energetically where you are, right? So it could even be beyond right. the confines of your space. It could be how, exactly. you know, the ways in which you're hospitable out in the community when you're block walking, right? So I just loved it as um, like trying to imagine it from like an overhead view, because I'm like, yeah, that's the work that needs to happen, right? And it's not right. like, to your point, GE, it's not um, the institution saying like, you know, here, here's the welcome buffet, like come grab. Um, right. You know, I think back to Ryan's kind of examples of how that work lives in her institution. It's like these iterative micro gestures that add up over time to right. trust <laughs> that maybe become like reciprocity, you know? It's like those things take years. Right. Yeah. And I also think it's like, it's not it's not left up to just one department, right? Like yeah. you would think that maybe a, something like block walking might come from like visitor services, but it doesn't have to be. Like it is, It when I introduced the idea, everyone was like, well, why is curatorial doing that? And it's like, well, why wouldn't we be? I mean, <laughs> I, it, you know, it, for a director to kind of be in streets inviting people to an institution, to their museum, it's like, it's important work. And so, yeah, I think, thank you for your question, um, GE. And yeah, thank, and thank you, you know, um, just to, to follow up on what Ryan was saying, you know, I thought for me, one of the most exciting um, parts of the book was Sandra um, Jackson Dumont talking about uh, the new institution that she is is running and um, I just felt like the language she was using was just so so different than what you would hear uh, from a sort of more traditional uh, museum person and um, it really made me think that um, the the sort of elevation of someone who has worked on the in the educational sphere um, in, in these institutions or the curatorial sphere to, you know, top leadership is, is, is really, is, is so, is so good because they have been so engaged in um, work with, with, with people. Um, so I loved that. I loved what she, the things that she said about this new institution and what the values were going to be that would underlie it. Thank you. Thank you for that great question, GE. And thank you for those super thoughtful responses. Um, I will be asking questions sort of for Nico, but it would be great to hear from anyone. Um, Nico, I was wondering if you had sort of a target audience in mind when you wrote the book and kind of off of that, did it reach folks who you weren't expecting? Was there an unexpected mm -hmm. audience who, you know, has taken it? Yeah, that's like such a tough, it sounds like an easy question, <laughs> but it's tough because, you know, like I said, like I, I, the contract to write the book was signed in 2019. And then in 2020, like our entire shit blew up and everything that we had been like theorizing and writing about had like totally 
changed, or at least our position to like the urgency of some of the work had changed. And so I think I changed, you know, I, I was in a place of being like, how do I respond, you know, not as a representative of an institution, but as like Nico Whedon person in the world. Um, how do I encourage, you know, these 43 people who are also experiencing this change, um, you know, to like maintain transparency and to like continue to offer up their thoughts as things are becoming more and more uncertain. And so, yeah, I think originally it was kind of like for the different, you know, concentric communities of the people that comprise the community of the book, right? So I was imagining, you know, the educators that contributed using it as a resource in their classrooms, the artists that contributed, um, you know, using it as a resource in terms of like talking about their work beyond the studio and beyond the kind of gallery, you know, like industrial complex. So I really was imagining it as a toolkit <laughs> um, to be used by people in the field, you know, whose work was somehow um, embodied or discussed, you know, in, in the book. And then I got, and there's a we like laughed about this, but then I got my um, first peer review after the draft one. And it was, you know, it was like reviewed by uh, likely like an old white guy who's worked in museums his entire life. And he was mad, right? Like he was like, you know, what is this abolitionist, like, you know, bullshit? Like why, I don't think you want to tear down museums. Like we're doing a good job. And like, here's all the things <laughs> we have done, and, you know? And my first response was like panic because I was like, oh no, is that who actually is going to be reading this book? Um, and have I completely like alienated, you know, an audience that like, I didn't, I wasn't even really imagining because that's not my orientation. But then I was able to like sit with the critique, integrate it into the language in terms of the introduction and like how it's framed, which is like, this book is not here to offer you like short term shortcut solutions. Cause that's what he wanted. It was like, I don't want to hear the problems. I want to hear solutions. Um, and I was like, that's not actually what this book is about. Like we haven't even triaged all the many crises going on at this moment. So let's invite voices and perspectives into this analysis so that we're doing it holistically and together. And so I think that actually was the moment where the book opened up and became for more people and became something that like anyone involved in change work might be able to benefit from. Um, and I really appreciated that as like uh, a moment of friction and, you know, um, yeah, a moment of friction that produced clarity for me in terms of how the rest of the book was framed in that kind of final edit. So short answer is like the book is for anyone that wants to transform institutions and build cultural belonging. <laughs> um, but, you know, the long answer is that like it's only as useful um, in your work as you you know make it. So, yeah. Can I just yeah jump in because it 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 fits into lately I've been thinking of this phrase orthopedic racism it's I don't know if it it it, it it's a little awkward but this idea of so many white institutions and certainly schools places I teach in so on and so forth sort of asking people of color to fix things to sort of be the ones and that's what this guy was he was like wait a minute you mean i have to really read this and think it and absorb it and listen um and instead he just wanted answer he wanted like a list of do this do this do this uh, but also nico you you've talked about how since you since the book has come out you have been asked by institutions to meet with the curators oh yeah <laughs> yeah there's all the funny <laughs> Well, you know, then there's like um, the ways institutions, and I don't even know if they've read the book, but they see the book or That's perceive the book seems, yeah. and its value, right? And I think, um, yeah, you know, I think, so the most exciting thing has been being invited by, you know, various museum directors at teaching museums to come and speak, because for me, that's like my joy, you know, which is being in dialogue with students, with people asking questions, um, with people that are not happy to accept and inherit what we've been given that are like, if it doesn't work, let's go build something new. Um, so that for me has been like illuminating and beautiful and like a thing I would not have imagined to be like where this book kind of circulates. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but then there's the kind of internal museum HR, uh, like working group kind of place, which also is starting to like have interest in the book. And I think that's a little tougher for me, right? Because you know, I don't, if I don't know you and I don't work with you, I can't say <laughs> how this book should apply to your, your work, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can present on why it's created and I can point you to amazing peers in the field, like doing the damn thing, but I cannot um, solve 
issues for an institution that I'm not embedded within and that I don't necessarily share values with. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that for me has been like a very um, challenging and humbling request, right? Which is like, do I just say no or do I show up um, and how do I show up, right? And so I think those are some questions I'm navigating now. Um, and again, like with a bit of insecurity as someone who doesn't actually work in museums anymore, it's weird to be positioned as an expert on a thing, which part of the reason that I opted to write this with 43 other people is that, you know, I don't see myself as the one that wrote this. I wrote this in community with 43 other people that are also asking these questions. And so to be positioned as like a singular expert on a thing that I no longer am like, you know, deeply enshrouded in feels mm -hmm. totally bizarre. It feels totally mm -hmm. bizarre, but I'm like riding the roller coaster. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nico. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we have come to the time in our NSC where we have a poetry reading. As many of you know, it is our tradition. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Sarah Sophia Yanni to the stage. Mexican Egyptian writer, researcher, and educator Sarah Sophia Yanni currently serves as managing editor of TQR. She was a finalist for Bomb Magazine's 2020 Poetry Contest, among many other awards. Her zines and text installations have been exhibited at Printed Matters LA Art Book Fair, Acid Free Art Book Fair, and others. And thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. And I'm so excited to turn it over to you. Oh, we, we might need, there we go. Should be okay now. Thanks, thanks so much. Can you hear me okay? Cool. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me and it's really privileged to have been able to just like witness this conversation um, between all these amazing thinkers and writers. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna try to share the PDF of the work I'm about to read, just in case people want to follow along. Um, it's not quite letting me. Um, is it okay if I share a screen? Just find that sometimes it's nice to be able to read along um, when it's reading something. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna close that with three, three poems and then everyone can go about their days. And the first poem is called I'm a Smart Girl. With practice, the story is more clear, infinitely more precise. So many times I've told it. At first, meandering pockets of details I didn't know how to empty. But now my edits are sharp. I get straight to the point because really it's simple. What happened was I folded myself neatly like paper stacked into a clean pile. And one day the wind was too strong. It blew me eastbound, tore the sheets in half, but they landed softly on green. Still, how could I have been so encumbered? We are told that joy is foolish, pain as a condition of intelligence. So I thought myself, the smartest of all girls. There's a thing in my stomach about this. I wish a lot of things, like for everyone to think I'm good. I used to be a lot of things too. And now I'm good at building beds taking the trash to the dumpster before it spills, remembering to turn lights out when I leave, walking top and bottom, putting the duvet cover on, dabbing cool white cream beneath my eyes and not looking in the mirror, instead merely trusting that beauty is there, finding home in my cheeks. Um, this poem is called Optimism. Being funny in real life is not enough. I want to be funny in my poem, but I can't be funny in a Google Doc. I can only be full of longing, reinscribing the same quote, when I desire you, a part of me is gone. My wants of you partakes of me. Thinking of the Friday on your rooftop where the world looks through these recent glasses, 
thinking of my dog who begs for affection and rejects it. It sounds a lot like someone I know and by someone I mean me. I want to walk around with you, hold your hand. I think my desires are that simple. Someone laughing at my joke, not out of pity, but in earnest. A hawker on the tree that's always in bloom, purple buds peeking through a window, a lavender breeze falling gently, bedrooms feeling spacious, and the pink glow of the sunrise are caught just in time. And this last poem is a dense <laughs> prose poem, but it's part of a, a text installation, which I guess is my rare um, participation in the, the visual art gallery world, if you will, um, called I Miss at Home Falling Backwards. I miss at home falling backwards. I am miss at home unsettled and vertical, striving to be whole. I'm always reaching. I come from homes all over. A long, long, long time ago, my people were an island, and mountain, and desert. And then a long, long time ago, they were in desert. And a long time ago, they came from desert to America, an island to coast, and from coast to America, and I streamed life into the city whose air we're trying to breathe. Page 26, I, a chronicle of five months. I live in a sublease in a stranger's room, sleeping in a stranger's bed. Things weren't always like this. Linen sheets, cast iron pan, a patio deck covered in ivy that used to be branches only, but now is green, like life is returning to both it and me. I read books that are not mine. I kill flies that come into the cracked plastic in the kitchen I only discovered during month two. So many things are broken here, and that's why it's real to me. Me, I, you. I'm in New York City, and I sing karaoke with you. A virus in my lungs, and somehow you don't get sick. Clean beyond the tears from 41, Alanis Morissette, photos of the flash on, and hugs, hugs, hugs. It's so sweet to be together these days. You bring me rice cake. You take me to get the best french fries in Manhattan because you know that's what I like. Three sleepless nights and a wind chill turning noses red. Kandinsky in an upward spiral. I walk along a waterfront and remember being 14 years old. I stare at my reflection in the subway window and pretend that this space is mine for a moment. I, we, well, I thought out for a month and we are all together. Sacred days of family lunch, family breakfast, holiday, New Year, birthday after birthday, and all of our plants are getting tighter. We laugh over beer and marshmallow salad. We eat food on sidewalks. This month changes everything like sometimes a month can. We sleep in one apartment, separate rooms, my mattress on the floor like it's for a little cockroach, he jokes. The first two nights, I'm too empty to sleep. I search on YouTube a five-hour video of the exact white noise machine I have in my room. It plays till my phone dies, and on day three, things are looking up. We walk in parks and gardens and play board games that get too competitive. I hate them because I always lose. I'm operating in fractured language here, but by the second week, it's coming back to me. The brain is so resilient. We are trying our best. We are breaking molds, and it's heavy, heavy stuff. Over dinner, we discuss our shared bloodline, how it weighs on us, how we wish to be understood more than anything, but at least we have each other sometimes. We... I, them, I visit them in Seattle, even though we've hardly met in real life. Touch has been so digital as of late. They are all so kind, a whole group of open hearts taking me in. People who have felt darkness, loss, confusion, queerness, and control. And we drink in a bar that has carpet and neon, and we dance around shifting bodies, cook communal meals, read books by the window with blankets. It is cold, and I wear four socks. The whole trip, I'm sad, but they drive me through rainy hillsides laughing, and in flashes, things feel possible. Then, I, before, 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 I'm in so many places, I'm only in one place. I find myself, I lose myself. I Sarah, we've lost your sound. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, no worries. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. Yeah, I think Thank my you. just died. Ah, um, <laughs> I'll just read this last, these last few lines. Um, 
before, 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 I'm in so many places. I'm only in one place. I find myself, I lose myself. I have to file change of address, nail boarding forms. I forget, I do not have a bed anymore. I do not have a parking spot. I have your wood beams in their hallways in my gold sedan. I have generations before me that lived in flux, telling me to hold my body close, telling me that sometimes your own body is your home. Your vessel is so full. You can keep yourself safe. You are good, good, good right here. Wow, Sarah, thank you for those transcendent words. That was a really, really incredible, perfect reading to end today. Um, don't forget to check out Sarah's website and social media in the chat. And thank you so very much again to our amazing guests and hosts. Thank you, Ryan, Ruby, Maria, Nika, and Thurza. It's been a really, really wonderful conversation today. Um, we'd also like to thank Lydia from the Mississippi Museum of Art for helping with coordination to make today's event possible. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program, making these daily conversations possible, and for their support of our growing archive, which you can find on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, today's video will be posted right after this. And over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has brought together art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, and thoughtful social and political meditations in our monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. And so please check the chat for a link to donate to support our writers and operations and editors here at The Rail. And please join us tomorrow at 12 p.m. for a conversation with Ian Chang and Charlotte Kent on the event of Life After Bob at the Shed. And we'll be concluding tomorrow with a poetry reading by Dot Devota. And yes, thank you everyone for joining us. You can now um, unmute. Can and I just say, jump in before, yeah, go before we all just, I just wanted to remind everybody and hope that there was a link put in about Ryan and Jackson, Mississippi, and if people um, can uh, and offer any support that way to what you're all going through down there. So anyway, yes. now we can all jump in and thank you, Thursa. <laughs> yes. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. This was fun. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Love y'all. It was amazing. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Thank day. Thank you, everyone. Great poetry, everyone. Sarah. <laughs>